Hi, I'm Sean, and in this one we're going to be talking about project coordination, specifically in the context of version control with Git. These slides are based on slides by Manuel Raglan, our previous software lead. So, most engineers, or people, version control like this. Let's say you've got a website, and you've made an improvement, and you want to make a change. Well, you just create a new file, just so you have that old one as a backup. But you do this over and over and over again, and you just end up with a folder with lots and lots of versions. Which, you know, works. But this doesn't work very well. If you expand the team, you can't really work like this. You have to be copying and pasting code. It gets very messy, hard to track. You can email it to each other or send it over DMs. And I mean, that works for like small one-off scripts, but it's not a great way to manage a project. If you work on two different parts, copying and pasting them together, you can end up with weird things happening where those additions conflict with each other and have unexpected bugs. And as you keep iterating, it might be that one version worked on in some way and you broke it down the line and now you don't know where that problem happened. So, Mr. Torvalds, creator of Linux, also created a version control system called Git, where each revision of your project is called a commit independently developed versions of your project are called branches, and when you bring those branches together, you call them a merge. So, if you want to use Git, you're going to have to install it. So you can use these commands for Ubuntu and Windows to install it. You could also go to the website and use the graphical installer if you're on Windows. While you're at it, I recommend installing the GitHub CLI or command line interface. It helps smooth the process of getting your credentials set up for, say, cloning private repositories if GitHub is the repository source you're using. All right, so first, you're going to need to initialize your Git project. So in a Git controlled project, there's actually a little folder called .git, and this contains all the inf important information about your version control. You don't want to touch this folder, you don't want to delete it, and the command that actually creates this folder is git init. Now, usually you're working off of a project that already exists, so you are going to instead do git clone and then the URL of that git repository. Uh, if that's the case. And sometimes this is where the credential managers like GitHub CLI come in handy because sometimes it can be a little tricky to get that login set up on your terminal. All right, so you've got a Git project and now you want to make some changes. Here's some commands that can actually help us first make a directory or folder called foo and then create a file called bar.txt inside of that. So if you're on Ubuntu uh, using bash, you would use the touch command to create that file. And if you're in PowerShell, you would use new item example.txt. And overall, you'd end up with a file structure that looks like git project slash foo slash bar.txt. All right, so we've made some changes. Now we want to add them. Adding basically tells git that these are the files that we want to save. So we're going to say git add and then either the path to that specific file, or if we want to be a little more loose, we can do git add dot and it will add all the files in the directory you're currently in. All right, so we've added, we've specified the files that we care about. Now we're going to git commit them. So when we commit, we're basically saving. This isn't the same as saving on your, fi um, on your file system. This is saving in the Git history. You're creating a point 
in time a snapshot of your entire project directory. And for this commit, you want to be very specific about what you've changed. And you don't want to be specific about the files you've changed because Git already tracks that. Your description of what you've changed should be functional, like adding a button that does something or fixing a specific bug, not a literal description of the files that you changed. Now, you want to add and commit changes often. And you want to do this at, say, like a some a part of your, the project that is kind of like a, a logical stopping point. You don't want to be committing giant chunks. It should be commits for very specific functional changes. Otherwise, it can be hard to figure out what went wrong. If you commit one giant set of changes, it's going to be really hard to track if you know adding a button broke something or maybe a bug you fixed is actually the cause of uh, something else breaking. So the git commit tree is the history of the different versions that we've committed. So if we first created a commit call uh, with the message created repo, and that's the only commit we've made, the tree would look like this. And the commit has a hash, which is just a unique identifier for the commit you made. So it's a way of kind of tagging that snapshot of the project so you can go back to it later. Now, the commit that you're currently looking at is the one where the head is pointing. So the head is just a way of describing the commit that you're currently pointed at. Now, let's say we've created a new commit with the message created first question. Now we've got another point in that timeline, in that tree. Now we've added the first button. And this example is for like, say a web form where you're adding questions, like in a survey. Um, now our tree is three commits long and we could in theory go back to any of those snapshot versions if we wanted to and so on we've added a second button and at this point the head is pointing to the latest commit typically your head is going to be pointing to the latest commit in your current branch all right so let's say we've messed up this is where knowing those commit hashes comes in handy because you can actually use git revert and then putting in that commit commit hash will take you back to that snapshot. Or rather, before that snapshot was made. Reverting a single commit, um, so again, head is usually pointing to the latest commit um, or whatever commit you're on. So if you do git revert head, it will revert back by one commit. Now, reverting actually creates a new commit in the history. So if you git revert head, you're actually making a new commit. And that commit is going to look like that snapshot, um, like the previous snapshot you made. So you are at added second button, you did git revert head, and now your project is going to be updated to look like the point where you created the first button. Now there's some more handy commands. There's git status. Git status basically tells you what branch you're on and what files you've added um, and what files you've changed. Git log gives you a history of the commits on your current branch. All right, so you might want to develop features in parallel because sometimes features can take a long time and maybe you want to make progress on two simultaneously, but you want to do them separately because you don't want something that's not compiling in one feature to not affect your ability to compile the other feature. So if you were trying to do this without version control, you'd probably just copy and paste the original file and develop each feature in a separate file. 
um, based on the original. Branches allow you to do this in a much more organized fashion. So this is where the tree idea of a git tree comes in, where you create a branch based off of a certain commit, a certain snapshot, and you develop on that branch, and then you can merge it back into the main, uh, main branch. So in order to create a branch, you can use git branch um, and specify the name. You can also use git checkout, which is a command for just switching, switching to a specified branch. If you use the dash b option, it allows you to both create a new branch and switch git um, to track that branch simultaneously. Now let's say you've made a few commits there. Now we're going to git merge and bring it back together. Um, and specifically, you are going to be merging um, the branch you specify in the command into your current branch. So now let's consider that you're probably going to want to be collaborating. Everything we've done thus far is just all local version control. It's only stored on your machine. So we're going to want to bring in a remote repository. Um, some examples include GitLab, GitBucket, and GitHub. In our group, we use GitHub. So when we're working on shared projects, we have to consider that other people are going to be uploading their changes to the remote repository and we're going to want to pull those changes down. It's like if you're working on Dropbox and someone uploads the latest version of a text file and in order to get those, you have to download them onto your local machine. And git pull is that download process. Now, if you're both on the same branch and someone's made a change, when you pull that in and you've also made changes in the same file, that's going to result in what's called a merge conflict. And you're going to have to do some manual text editing to figure out how to put those changes together. Now, if someone's created a separate branch and pushed it to the uh, remote repository, you can use git fetch to uh, allow your project to reflect those branches that now exist. So git fetch is less of pulling down the changes and more like checking Dropbox to see if someone's uploaded a new file. And then once you know that that branch exists, you can, or rather once git knows that that branch exists in the remote repository, you can then check it out locally. All right, and to continue with the Dropbox metaphor, git push is like uploading your changes. So you've added, you've committed, and then you're going to push um, to the remote repository. And the remote repository, like your local repository, is also going to have branches. So usually when you git push for the first time on a new branch, you actually have to initialize that remote branch as well and that remote branch will then be tracking your local branch, meaning that it will be reflecting the changes you make as you push them. All right, so at some point you're gonna to wanna to combine your changes. And sometimes uh, when it's not the main branch, you can just merge branches together locally in your own repository. But if you're merging with a main branch, and this is where Basically everything comes together. This is supposed to be your latest building development version. You should be submitting what's called a pull request, which is essentially a request in the web portal uh, to make a merge where someone else can review your changes first. This might involve them downloading your branch um, and checking to see if it compiles on their machine. It could involve a series of tests but essentially what this allows for is keeping the project stable. Now, some might consider this bad practice, but when I was first learning Git, I had to use this a lot. Git reset dash dash hard origin slash main. So let's say you've created a new branch and it has somehow gone horribly wrong um, and you don't know what to do. You don't know how to revert your changes. 
if you do a git reset dash dash hard origin slash main, it will revert your branch to the latest commit um, in the remote main, in the remote repository's main branch. It's a bit of a nuclear option, and I wouldn't recommend it if you have anything super important, but if something's completely messed up and you're not really attached to the changes you've made, this may be an option for you. All right, so some best practices to remember. Commit frequently and commit with good messages, specifying what your changes have done. When working on something new, create a new branch for it. And don't commit directly to the main branch. And some exceptions here might include if you're working on a project alone or if it's in the very early days of a project and it's just not worth having um, a review process because your main code itself is not stable yet. So that's a lot of commands. So here's a bit of a common workflow that can cover most of your use cases. So you're creating a new feature. So you're going to check out dash B, a new branch for that feature. That means that you're creating a new branch and you're switching your local project folder to be on that branch. And then you're going to do an, your development. It's going to be iterative. You're going to pull. You're going to check your status. You're going to add, commit, and then push. And you push to the remote repositories branch uh, that's synced with your local branch in order to make sure that your files are saved and backed up in the cloud in case your computer explodes or something. And then once you've finished your development process, uh, you're going to make a pull request on GitHub, and hopefully that'll be merged into main. And once this has happened and you've closed up this new branch, you're going to get check out main, and then you're going to get pull. You're going to get the latest version of the main branch, which if you've made a pull request should now reflect the new feature that you've created. I want to be clear, uh, there's a lot of ways to use Git, and this is definitely not the best Git tutorial on YouTube. So this is just one way of doing things. It's a tool with many features, and many people have different workflows. Sometimes people use something called rebasing instead of merging. So there's plenty to learn, and you'll probably encounter many different workflows throughout your career. I want to leave you with a very cool resource called Learn Git Branching. It allows you to visually see what Git branching is doing. I highly recommend at least doing the main introduction sequence and the remote push and pull to understand what we've talked about in this video. Um, and if you do all of those, I think you'll have a solid base understanding of Git for your projects.